Yemen Fishin and Yemen, I think, that was came out like 10 years ago, uh, which was decent. I can't remember who was in that, but, okay. but uh, yeah. Okay, so I'm recording, so I'm going to edit this, and I'm going to okay. um, start now. Okay. So I am with the writer, Yemen K. Dickinson, whose work I first encountered in a creative writing, uh, writing class um, that I was teaching in 2019. And I'm not sure if I was teaching it or I was learning uh, from what I was reading. There were so many talented writers. And uh, Yemen, you were one of the writers immediately when I read your um, 2019 short story machine, which is um, the topic of now many of my assignments uh, features is helping me to teach and uh, a few classes, um, a literature class, a freshman composition class, and of course, creative writing. So let's begin with your name, because I think it's a story. <laughs> Yemen K. Dickinson. The K is mysterious, and I, I want to find out about that. The name Yemen, I've looked it up. Uh, Yemen is a country. It's a land of milk and honey. Uh, where did you get that name? And Dickinson, Emily Dickinson, you seem to, you know, Right. All these yeah, yeah, all these things. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, well, the name was, uh, I guess, like one of my mom's friends said I looked like a Yemen. So I don't know. I don't know what that looks like or what, uh, where, you know, where she got it. But um, it is obviously, you said a country. Um, and uh, she thought it was different. I think all of my siblings have uh, different names um, that are very unique. Like uh, my brother's Maceo, which is named after my father that was a uh, very unique i think it has like northern europe roots macedonia and georgia or eastern europe uh, but um but yeah my parents were always uh looking for something different and i guess put it off of the map so mm -hmm. uh, i could have been anything any country <laughs> i guess so you were um born in missouri born in missouri okay born in yemen Kansas. also means south it can mean south and Yemen is in the south part of the province. And I have to tell you, I okay. have by um, marriage, I'm related to one of my nephews married a Yemeni uh, oh. Jewish woman. And yes, you could pass as a Yemeni. So okay, okay. I'll, I'll just tell you that. Um, okay. So tell me about that, Missouri, all the way to Los Angeles, California. Yeah, um, I grew up there. I still go back, so I have a lot of family there. Um, it's it's different i mean i think one of the things that i like about uh los angeles is the diversity um so kansas city is not as diverse um but i think even that it's it's much smaller obviously than los angeles so you can get from one side of the town to the other in about 12 minutes because it's a, a little bit different from los angeles where it, you know takes you an hour to get from one side to the other but um uh, i think the people i, I really enjoy people i think um i guess you know people will say real and whatnot but you know it's it's different it's a different different uh, different city but i enjoyed it you know has uh really good barbecue if you're into barbecue it's probably one of the biggest things that, that comes from Kansas city but uh, but yeah it's nice so let me ask you another question about a story not just your name and before we move uh, on i have to know what is the k uh khalifa Khalifa. 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 Yeah. Okay. So that's also um, Arab. Arabic. Yes. Arabic. Yes, it Sorry. is. Khalifa. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, um, I grew up uh, Sunni, Sunni Muslim. Um, and um, so that's where, you know, that my name is hyphenated. So my father's name um, was uh, Dickinson and uh, my mother uh, name was Khalifa. So so yeah, that's that's for that. Um, and for people who don't know about the Sunni and the Shia, the Sunni is, and I don't know. So, oh yeah, uh, it's the more spiritual I've heard. Um, well, that that may be more Sufi. Sufi is Sufi. Sufi is Sufi is more mystical and spiritual. Um, there was there was a split between you know uh, after Muhammad passed, there was an idea of who had the, the you know leadership for Islam. Um, and so um, the Shia say that it believed that it ran through his uh, lineage, his family and Sunnis didn't say it had, had nothing to do with Muhammad's family. So 
that was a split. I mean, they, there's still a lot of differences, but you know, those, those are the main things on who, who was the rightful heir to, to it. Yeah. I, I had heard that story and unlike a lot of people who have just yeah. a glancing knowledge of this, I think it's because uh, friends who are Sunni are telling me we're more spiritual, we're more legitimate. Right. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, does that concern you? How how much does religion, spirituality impact you? Because you have a 2020 general science degree from Rutgers University, but wait for it. You dropped out of Rutgers when your mother died suddenly of a brain aneurysm. You went to uh, California and you became part of the film industry. Right. Uh, that story, uh, can you tell yeah. us? Yeah, I, um, you know, was in school and then after it was, uh, it was the summer after uh, my junior year and um, I was staying up, you know, in, in Jersey for the summer and um, just got a phone call that, you know, she, had, she was at a cousin's wedding, my, one of my cousin's wedding and um, she had to rush to the hospital. She was having a, um, a brain aneurysm, you know. And uh, so she was in a coma for a couple of days. So we flew back. My brother and I uh, flew back um, to Kansas City during that time. And um, just, you know, once something traumatic like that happens, you, you start to think about life and what you really want. And so so things so I just felt like it wasn't the time for me to to go back um, to, you know, to represent that time and, and wanted to really um, pursue what I really uh, I was wanting to do was was film. So, um, what specifically in film? Because of course, my interest in you is as a fabulous writer. Mm. And, uh, yeah, it was it was always kind of write, writing, directing, um, and then I was you know doing more editing um, and photography uh, for years. So I was doing more more of that. Um, as you know, sometimes it's it's really hard. It's it's kind of a club. So to get in, it's it's you know. It's yes. a, a lot of you know you gotta have the right connections and the right people so it's it's sometimes it could be really difficult you know but um yeah, yeah but that's that's what uh that was my idea so i like to think of this journey yemen which means south in arabic mm. yemen khalifa dickinson uh, an american yeah. story but going from one kind of south to another kind of south in, here in southern california um so in your uh biography uh or researching you um I've learned that you are interested in social justice and the scientific applications thereof. Can right. you discuss that and how that relates to film and your writing? I actually, we know it relates to machine. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I think that, uh, I've always something that I, you know, I think even with, uh, what I wanted to do, you know, with data science, um, there's, I think there's a lot more money in kind of financial, you know, if you can figure out some kind of way to make make money for for other people, you're always going to make and, money. And data but, science uh, is your graduate degree that you're pursuing. Right, right. Okay. That I'm pursuing the data science. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm I'm more interested. I mean, to me, it's rather boring. But I, you know, I kind of want things that uh, have impactful uh, impact on other people um, and and social justice. I mean, for instance, there's. Um, there's, I mean, so much data. I mean, one of the things that really interests me about the, the, the field of data science is that there's so much information that we're gathering um, that's gathered and um, being able to help make decisions based off of that. You know, for instance, looking at why certain demographics get stopped more than others based off of cell phones, particular area, you can kind of see and start to look and, and make, um, make conclusions based off of just data that you know that's kind of in the background um so you can you know that is uh, look at things fascinating like that. Yeah. um and a little scary it's almost you know imagine somebody right. being, yeah yeah being stuck yeah technically. yeah and that's and that's another thing too is like i think we need good people in that field because if we you know just have people that are in in it just for the money without you know any type of uh moral compass you know, behind it and just doing it just for, you know, what I can make out of it, what I can do to get money out of it versus, you know, we need, um, just for instance, there's, you know, in a lot of the AI technology, it has problems, um, uh, registering or recognizing a lot of people in color because a lot of these algorithms are made for 
typically white men, you know. Um, so if there's someone that has a skin tone closer to mine, it may not pick up and register, which could be a good or bad thing, you know, but it's, you know, but so a lot of these things. So it, it's good to have, you know, a good uh, uh, diversity in, you know, especially in that, because you can say, oh, well, let's look at this or like different perspectives. So I think anything, you know, if you have different perspectives, sometimes different backgrounds, you know, people that have different histories can help bring in, you know, a different perspective that will help, you know. Yeah, I'm yeah. thinking of um, when Philando Castile was murdered, and mm. um, of course another social justice issue. Um, right. The cop who did that walked, but he was stopped some astronomical. Right. I, I don't. I want to say 49 times, or but yeah. it's it's yeah. really that much, right. and it becomes right. scarier to think right. that maybe. A police officer isn't seeing the driver, but stalking the driver is right. really terrifying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, I feel good to know that you're going to go into this field and protect us, yeah. <laughs> make it safer for all yeah. of us. Because yeah, yeah. when one group yeah. is attacked, we're all attacked. Right. And right. if we don't realize yeah. that, it's too late. The ship goes down. Right. Uh, it reminds me of Nazi Germany. You know, people just yeah. weren't aware. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about your protagonist in Machine, um, the story that you wrote in 2019, um, which seems like a film already to me. The okay. second I read your story, it's, I stopped seeing the words. I felt like Neo and Matrix. I was seeing the code. I was seeing Dr. Right. Sean, and I'm, am I pronouncing his last name correctly? Iosolo? Iosolo? Yeah. Iosolo. Yeah. Okay. And, yeah. And is, what kind of last name is that? I... I made it up. It was, uh, I, I made it up, but I wanted it to kind of be ambiguous. Um, um, so I, I, that's, that's the name. I just completely made the last name up and, uh, especially on, on, I guess on certain characters, it was just a matter of wanting the reader to kind of paint their own story, you know, um, kind of envision what they had on, on, uh, for that. So that, yeah, that last name, it wasn't, uh, I just, yeah, I made it up. Well, for me as the reader, it was very interesting because I wasn't really looking at your avatar in the creative yeah. writing class. And I thought, is okay. he Norwegian? Is he yeah. African? It almost sounds like it's Igbo Nigerian. Who is yeah. this This guy in the first name, Sean? And I like yeah. the ambiguity. And Sean yeah. is working. He is a cardiologist in the story. And he's working with, sometimes with his friend. Uh, Dr. Moses Kim, they're both in the Monroe office building in downtown LA, I like the setting yeah. as a Californian. Yeah. And um, the advent of something called RC45 has made Sean's job as a cardiologist um, pretty much obsolete, and also Dr. Right. Kim's. <laughs> right. And right. the story yeah. just opened so memorably with the pale, saggy ass that immediately yeah. caught my attention. Yeah, yeah. I thought, where are we going to go with this? And what I yeah. really liked in this story, uh, and we'll come to the theme in a moment, I really like the theme, but you um, did a brilliant job with the exposition. You weren't telling, I was. you were showing me with right. what happened in the story. So. I knew when I read the story that I'm not dealing with an unskilled writer that I have to explain. So don't tell so much. Yeah. Uh, right. You had it yeah. all down. Um, have course. you written throughout your life? Um, I've always loved writing. Um, even in high school, you know, classes, I've always enjoyed the creative, uh, you know, creative writing assignments. Um, so I was always uh, and like, you know, I had an English teacher that told me that I should pursue it. Um, and he would read some of the stories that I had to his wife. Um, then, so I've always enjoyed it, always thought of it, you know, but, um, you know, I think the, um, I think, I mean, you know, going in, going to school and then, and I think that's to kind of ties back to the death of my mother was, you know, after, even after high school, something that I wanted to do, pursue a more creative, uh, field, um, you know, you sometimes you're you're stifled by actually making a living. Like, oh, okay, well, it, will I be able to get a job? You know, doing this or doing that. So you you know go into something that you think you're going to be able to get a job with. And so I think that goes back to when my mother passed. And me, you know, kind of like, okay, maybe I'll veer into more of this creative 
tap into this creative side that I've, you know, I've always enjoyed or wanted to do. Um, and so back full circle back into, uh, back into science. Um, but I think that, you know, sometimes it's not as black and white as we make it as far as left and right brain. Like, I think that, uh, even so many things that, you know, we can, we use our creativity to, you know, and it's not static, like, oh, you have to be either, or, you know, this or creative or not, you know, so you have to be, even as a scientist, I think you're, you're always being creative and coming up with different things and looking at things differently. So I think, uh, you know, some, and most, you know, a lot of our great scientists, you know, um, throughout history, were both artists and science. So I, I kind of, uh, pick up that mantle and book and see, you know, how I can, how I can do that. Yeah. So I want to touch on um, something in here too, and I'll be editing this tape. Um, but you mentioned black and white, that science isn't really black and white or left and right brain. But I want to talk about you as a black writer. Uh, of mm. course, in this country, your color, your black, white, red, brown, or yellow. Right. <laughs> How yeah, we yeah. categorize ourselves. We don't know what to do when we're out of right. the country. Although I think there is the, the black, white dichotomy there throughout the world with colonization right. and everything. But you, um, your your name is Yemen Khalifa Dickinson, so it's an American story. Somebody who is from an Islamic background. Um, and it was interesting for me again, because I didn't know you're a black writer. I didn't really look at that tiny avatar that what mm. interested me immediately was the writing that I felt mm. I knew you as a writer. Yeah. Um, but I'm thinking of, of course, our most famous American writer. And I don't like to say black American writer because in a way, <laughs> That's so pejorative with James Baldwin because yeah. he just transcends all Oh my of God. Yeah. I love uh, him. Yeah. I have, um, here. Yes. I have it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I just, um, I remember reading another country. I, I was born in 1962 and that was written in 1962. And it was amazing to me because I thought we're dealing with the same crap right. today. Yeah that he's writing yeah. about. Of course, he would say it much more eloquently than crap, but he'd call yeah, it crap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And his struggle was that, of course, he came back from France to be part of the civil rights movement in the United States. He left France to free himself, that he's not the black man over right. there. And of course, right. he's famously told an equal in Paris. And I know you know that. Yeah. Um, he has a short story anthology, Going to Meet the Man. And there's one story in there where mm -hmm. he writes, there are no, racism is not the background noise, a perennial background noise in his stories or front and center. And also in another famous American writer, Zora Neale Hurston's, it's, you know, it's always there. Right. Anyway, Baldwin said that I feel guilty. He felt a sense of guilt if he did not bring the issue of race front and center in his work and in this one yeah. story in going to meet the man which is good but it's just not as good yeah. or maybe not yeah. as absorbing to me about yeah. the murder of a white child by um a white man yeah. um the other do you feel are did baldwin free you that you can be um everything you are but you don't right. have to be black. Do you feel a sense of guilt if your stories are ambiguous that you don't know who the character is? Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think it's, I think it's, I think definitely that is something that you're thinking about. Um, you know, I, I think the m most important thing, I mean, I think in, in stories or, or writing, I think is to have a good story, you know, and I think that good stories transcend you know a lot of these other issues you know like you know, whether whether you're white or black or whatever you know what whatever you are i think that first the connection of like on a human level it's you know um you you connect on a human level and i think empathy is a really good and a strong something to elicit from your reader to get emotion for your characters to have some type of empathy or something for those characters i think so i think that that's a that's, I think, first and foremost for me is just to have a really good story. Um, and really good stories, I think. Um, you can see yourself or see something in that. So, like, you know, even if it's a story about a white woman, I can see parts of that humanity within that. Um, however, I do think that, um, 
being black or have, you know, a, a minority, that there is a duty to bring attention to certain elements. So if you can bring that, bring those in with a good story first, and then tie it in with something that someone, you know, walked away looking at something different, you know, or maybe challenges. I think it's good to be challenged on, you know, a lot of things that we are, we, the way we see things, the way we look at things and to, to maybe look at something different and say, well, okay, well, I've looked at it this way. Maybe this could be, this could be different. But I think that uh, even from, um, you know, from a black American, uh, black male in the country, I think you can, you know, bring that just so that as an, as an educational um, means of, of, given an outlook of how, you know, someone sees something uh, in this country. I think James Baldwin would have envied you. And in a lot mm -hmm. of ways, he just did such a massive job of education with everything yeah. he did. Yeah, yeah. And um, in such a moving, eloquent way, but he yeah. would have envied to you could be all of you yeah. and not just a part of you where um, he he had to be the black man and right. you know as yeah. he um as he expresses um that so going back to um this story and how you'll rescue me <laughs> mm. in one of my assignments particularly in freshman comp because i like students to think about their major um mm. because it's a it's a huge investment of right. you know money right. and effort time they're putting yeah. their lives on hold um this is what i'm using your story for in my freshman comp class the literature mm -hmm. classes i'm using okay. them for how to show and not tell okay. um but this is this is to make them them think and i wanted to ask you about your ideas about the worth of a college education um i've become cynical as a teacher as I've gotten older and I've thought I, I ponder frequently A, B, C, D, F mm. and uh, late policies and the teacher is obstacle, in, an institutional obstacle to student right. success, particularly for black students, I think, the white yeah. teacher as an obstacle. Yeah. Um, and I'm thinking that your STEM major seems like, okay, it's not going to be um, something that can not be useful to you later on. But I worry about the majors that other students are are majoring in. Like, can they make a living from this? Or right. are they gonna yeah. be working at Starbucks? Right. Um, can you share your, your ideas about that? Because Dr. Sean Ioslo, yeah. Ioslo, Dr. Sean yeah. Ioslo, yeah. becomes redundant, as the Brits yeah. would say. And so does Dr. Moses Kim. These are highly right. educated men and yeah. technology. They're, they're almost, it's funny, um, Dr. Uh, Sean Ioslo is almost like a little bit like a Luddite in the end, where yeah. he's yeah. looking at this pale, saggy ass that is now tight and tanned <laughs> from this right. miracle. Um, yeah. And he just, you know, he's enraged in the end he's screaming and i think of yeah. the the luddites the textile workers trying to break yeah. their machines right yeah what is your idea yeah i think major? i think it is something that again i think something we're gonna have to really you know grapple with as a society you know i think um you know there's a, a big movement you know of um the uh, universal income you know um but I think that machines, you know, like if, if, if there is, you know, a machine that can do a job, is it something that we should have humans doing? You know, I mean, and I think this is, I'm, I'm not saying that we should or shouldn't, but I think it's something that we should really like think about. Um, you know, if there's a, if there's a machine that can actually um, flip a burger, is that something that we should have humans doing? Should humans, instead of that seven hours flipping a burger, should that human be, you know, writing or composing music or uh, planting a garden or doing other things that, you know, that we, you know, should do. I mean, I, I do, and I'm, I'm tired and even myself, I have, you know, there's, um, I'm conflicted because I, you know, if I go to, you know, a sushi spot or, you know, poke, I enjoy talking to, you know, the person behind there making my, you know, making my meal and asking, you know, how their day was or 
how their family's doing. So I, I do enjoy that human connection between, you know, ha actually having humans there. But I, I do, you know, there is, I think, I think there is value. There is a, there's to be asked about how, uh, what humans role is, what's their role. And, you know, I guess what you could say, even menial tasks, um, you know, um, but I know like even from, um, attorneys that are, you know, a lot of their, a lot of their job, you know, like even contract, you know, writing for contracts and things like that, a lot of them are just being outsourced to from India for, you know, um, and that's kind of how I came up with the story because it's always been, you know, it's usually the, the lower skilled, um, less educated are usually the fir on the front line for, you know, so many things, you know? Um, and so even with, um, even with that, it was like, okay, well, let's go to the other, to the, to the other end. And that's usually, you know, a, a doctor or a cardiologist and, and actually see what happens when his job is in jeopardy, um, and how he responds and what's going to happen with that, you know, not just, you know, pick, you know, the, the frontline workers. Um, but, um, I think that, I think there is something to be, to be said or something that uh, we should think about on universal basic income, you know, uh, on how and if that has a, has a future for, for all of humanity. Will we ever achieve that? I'm wondering because of this economic system we're caught in, we have enough food and goods for everybody. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, that's the thing. I think that even now, I mean, you know, I've heard stats as far as like we have, we produce enough food so that no one goes hungry. You know, we have enough, but it's just the mere, like our system itself, you know, our economic system that creates these dearth, this, you know, this, um, um, creates this poverty, you know, creates, you know, hunger because, you know, because of the market, the way the market says, well, we can't create because you're having to create this artificial create artificial um demand for something you know but we you know there's so much food that's wasted there's you know markets there's you know the technology there's things that we can do but it's just you know so i think that again i think it's you know for you and i or people that have you know, um, a conscious for those things that we have to kind of really push push the envelope to make you know make our governments make our you know society you know, move forward towards those things that, that we want to see. Okay. Thank you so much. I think I've got yeah. enough for the literary magazine. If I, okay. if I look at it and I think that I need more, okay. then I will come and I will do more. Um, do you have okay. any other stories? And I'm going to stop the recording right now. I have another question for you. Uh, I read somewhere uh, and I've got it neatly parsed in a statistic, like a little document in one of my classes, that about 68% of professions require a college degree and it's climbing and it's a graduate degree. What is the worth of all college degrees? Sometimes I think that the educational system is a bureaucracy, it's a monopoly, mm -hmm. that it's creating um, a need that may not necessarily be a need that you have to have your degree so people put their lives on hold they go into debt that they're paying off when their kids are adults right horrifying stories um have we created a monster uh something that is a, an educational bureaucracy that you know don't pass go you're not going to collect your 200 bucks can people be working jobs now that require degrees without degrees I, I mean, just from myself and even, you know, just recently getting, you know, bachelors, I, I do think that there are more doors that are open with the bachelors just by, you know, looking at, uh, if you just go to Indeed or Glassdoor or any of the, you know, that most of them will, you know, something, not even necessarily something that you studied, but they will, you know, have a, at least a bachelor's as like a foot in the door um, you know, to, to get in, um, especially for non-technical, if you're not like engineering or computer science, um, you, you do kind of need, uh, I think that, um, but I think there's, you know, there's also, you know, I know like I, there was a story, uh, recently of in Texas, I think where they're actually 
trying to get uh, more skilled workers for, you know, electricians, you know, um, that a lot of people that just because of the name, like to say, oh, I have this degree or I have a master's or things like that. But there, I think in the article, it referenced that uh, starting the electricians for the school district, I think in Texas, were making more than, you know, people with a master's in Harvard. Um, so if, if that's, if, you know, so I think you have to take it on a, you know, on an individual basis and what it is that you really want, you know, and I, I think that even not necessarily being enrolled or being in school, um, dictates that you're a learner, but like a person who loves to learn, no matter what it is, you know, if you have a degree or not, or where, wherever you are in life, I think it's, I think it's just a good thing to be a person who's always wanting to learn, you know, and there's, you know, there's a lot of avenues down that you can, you know, get on your computer and take classes and learn and, and do things on yourself. But, you know, I, I think that the, the bachelor's now and it still, you know, helps you get in, helps, helps you get your foot in the door. Um, so I want to play on that phrase uh, a little bit more, although you've yeah. explained this very eloquently, your thoughts. Um, a bachelor's helps you get in. Who are the gatekeepers? Henry right. David Thoreau, of course, graduated from Harvard. And yeah. way back in the 19th century, he was saying he was disillusioned with Harvard, that he mm. didn't like that uh, a degree was associated uh, or conferred social status. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering, again, what about Quentin Tarantino, who didn't go to film school? Right. Yeah. What about yeah. Bill Gates, who did not graduate right. from Harvard yeah. because yeah. he was beyond Harvard? Yeah. Um, so I'm wondering, again, this idea of an educational bureaucracy that uh, it's an artificial need sometimes. That right. Yeah. People put their lives on hold and... Um, for me, as a community college teacher, English teacher, more than half of my students live below the poverty line. And right, yeah. we have such nasty euph euphemisms as, um, uh, what is it, food challenged or something like yeah. that. When you're yeah. starving, yeah. you don't have enough right. food. You yeah. know, whatever yeah, 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 whatever yeah. it is yeah. we need. I'm just, yeah. my mind is yeah. boggling and I'm getting upset yeah, yeah, and yeah. thinking about right. it. And right. I'm thinking we're very very difficult for students there's no way mm -hmm. that they can go to school without accruing mm -hmm. crippling debt yeah. um, without working and of course yeah. statistically um, I've learned that if a student works more than 15 hours a week the GPA starts to plummet right. and we look at the graduation rates by the National Center for Education Statistics and 90% or 91% some huge figure graduate from elite schools yeah. Um, that admit fewer than 25% of the applicants. And from the public yeah. universities, which are public funded, it's about 60%, somewhere around yeah. there. Yeah. The exact figures. But if we look at the racial achievement gap, it yeah. drops down. It's 40%, for example, right. for black students. Right, yeah. And um, is yeah. a degree an institutional obstacle to just life, to success? Is it? systemic racism requiring it sometimes because I, we yeah yeah I, I mean i think i mean i think the value again i think the that you know training or getting you know the i think i mean even as far as like a bachelor's itself i think the big for me the biggest thing was really the understanding of how to think and you know critically think i think that really helped you know do you have to go to get you know get a bachelor's to do that i don't think so but I think just from you know writing classes English history classes when you're you know you're learning to communicate you know and those are the things that you know like they've always said that um, there's a reason why like you know most curricula you know the the um, they have they have calculus and like if you were like in high school like for math they have you know calculus and, and uh, if, if you're a mechanical engineer or you're doing engineering, calculus is great. You really need to use it if you're doing a really technical field. But like, for instance, for in high school, it's not necessarily like statistics would be a better option for people to really learn and which is starting to change. But the whole idea of calculus being put into the curriculum was because of the red scare of like, you know, we needed all of these, you know, uh, rocket scientists. So they added this. So my point is that I think a lot of things were, you know, even they want like the system itself or add, you know, these 
classes that we have, it's like you're basically training people for the workforce. So this is how you go to get trained. Like we, you know, like in the 50s, they thought they were going to need more rocket science because of Russia. So they went and, you know, added calculus so that people can, can, can you know, learn how to be, become a rocket scientist. Um, but I think that, you know, so many things that, uh, um, you know, I still think, I mean, especially for, you know, for black or, you know, for black kids, I think that there is value, you know, I, I know you had mentioned like Bill Gates and, you know, even um, Zuckerberg didn't really finish their degree. But I think that they came from, you know, they had, you know, they were on money. third base. Let's right, right, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So they had, they had, you know, even from just the connections, you know. And I know it's, you know, it's hard. I mean, even my journey on it was wasn't, you know, this just straight, you know. So it was it was years, and you know, and and I can see that even, you know, some of things are opening up a little bit more, you know, because you can say, okay, well, I have this or that. So I, I, I still think there is value in it. I understand there is the a lot of bureaucracy behind, you know, actually getting there and, and getting it, you know, um, but I, I still think there is, I still think there is value at this point, you know, um, and that doesn't mean that's the only way to do it. You know, um, you can, you can do it other ways, but I think that's the easiest, the easiest way. Um, how does it make you feel, and I know you know this statistic already, when you think that there are, according to Education Week, 98 different kinds of high school diplomas. How yeah. do not prepare students for college-level work? Now, who is <laughs> the hardest hit? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. Uh, minority communities, low-income right. communities. Yeah. Um, by sheer numbers, you have more poor white people than anybody else, but we look at the percentages and then we see, right. okay, this is institutional racism. You're 2.7 yeah. times more likely to be poor if um, you are black than if you are right. white. Um, yeah. Let's talk for a moment about Asians and what they've managed to do. Of course, they had mm. reparation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so they're about 5.8% of the population. They have outstripped whites in terms of mm. earning power. Um, they lead the pack mm. uh, with their um, graduation statistics and mm. uh, uh, generations of yeah. doctors and lawyers um can we can we learn anything from them the asian tiger parent how they came from being a minority that was incarcerated i'm laughing yeah. because it's kind of horror yeah. <laughs> you yeah. laugh and yeah. cry right right incarcerated yeah. in the desert and what can we learn i mean what can we learn from them yeah i, the I think so I... and the lower income black kid in particular Right. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, I think there is um, there is something to, you know, to be said about hard work. You know, I, I think there is something to to be said, you know, about um, having grit. You know, there is a big you know, there is a thing of just, you know, and I know sometimes it's overwhelming. And I think that, you know, some, we don't really we don't value just the kind of the small things that are done consistently. You know, like even, you know, other students that are just starting, you know, even whether it's high school or even college, it's just like, just go to class, just make a commitment that you're going to, you know, and I know that there's a lot of things, but just, you know, small things that can build over time, you know, and, you know, like by making a commitment that I'm going to go to every class, uh, making a commitment that I'm going to turn in every assignment. Now, it may not be an A or may, may not be perfect, but just doing small things that, well, because sometimes things just compound if you don't, you know, you don't, you start, you miss one class and you miss three, you know, and then just goes on and on. So I think that even just having those ideas of just doing things small and steady, it's like that, that you know, like the tortoise and the hare is just that the small, slow thing. Sometimes we don't really, you know, we, um, someone used the term microwave society, like we want things really fast. Like we want to just take it, open the door, put it in, pop it up for a minute and be done, you know, but sometimes it's, you know, the slow roast is, is a little bit better, you know, the putting it in a crock pot and cooking it for six hours. So um, all that to say, I, I do think that there is, there is uh, something that can be learned from, you know, the Asian community on uh, thing. Do you think that teachers, just in your experience, um, because you are the one you are the black college graduate and you graduate and especially from Rutgers and just the very fact that you know your family is Islamic 
you're thinking outside the box, you have to be. Um, yeah. Just because you're going against mainstream culture, whether you like it or not, or whether in, right. you intend to make it a stand. And I'm thinking of uh, if teachers need to understand that it's very hard to have a growth mindset when you're suffering from racial trauma. It's very yeah. hard to have grit when you're suffering from racial right. trauma. Yeah. And that there might even be an argument that Asian people definitely had racial trauma, but in every mm. single country in the Americas, including Canada, which tries to yeah. appear virtuous, yeah. uh, people of African descent have been enslaved, especially in Mexico. And people yeah. who are Mexican will say, no, that's not so. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's that whole colorism in Mexico City. Yeah. You know, they yeah. had the, the nine different ethnic groups right. in uh, at the Cathedral of um, Our Lady of Guadalupe yeah. on the wall. Like this is the color and this is this is a place that's yeah. colonized. And yeah, there's I mean, that uh, it brings me to uh, another there's a uh, there's a uh, I think she's a social psychologist, uh, Dr. Joy DeGruy. I think she's out of Port the University of Portland, but she talks about the post-traumatic stress syndrome for, especially for African Americans, and what has happened for you know since slavery and going up through Jim Crow and certain things. So she has some really interesting ideas. You know, it, it even goes back to you know how uh, because of generations of trauma that have happened you can see it manifested on a daily, you know, especially in black communities, um, you know, how just for instance on, you know, and I know even myself being black and other family, like, you know, she uses the example of, you know, when she takes her, she's black herself, uh, she takes her grandchildren into the bank and at a, you know, a two or three year old boy, they want to explore. They, you know, they, they go and she was, you know, she would talk about how, um, you know, a white parent will let, you know, she would always say, oh, little Johnny, just go and explore and do this and that, you know, because, and it's, and that helps to foster creativity, helps to foster this, you know, self-confidence to where you can go out and, you know, whereas, you know, you, a lot of times, and I know from personal experience, a lot of times it'll be, you know, the black parent will be, no, you know, it's really strict and structured, you know, where, it's like you better stand right here and stand next to me and it's very kind of uh, militaristic about you know the way that the parenting style mm -hmm. and i think it stifles you know it so you come up with this you know and this these these you know parenting styles are handed down you know like um you know from generation to generation and and you know we can you know go on and you know my parents growing up um my mother my grandfather my mother was born in Mississippi and um, they ended up in Kansas City because he was, um, the Klan was on their, the Klan was, was burning a cross on their, on their lawn. And my mother was the oldest and she, she'd have to like, uh, they would, my grandmother would hide the kids between the mattresses because of things that were going in. So they, and my grandfather got into a fight with the Klan member, packed up the car and had family in Kansas City. So that's how I ended up in Kansas City. Wow. So these trauma and things that you have, you know, a lot of trauma um, that, you know, Dr. DeGruy talks about um, has, you know, there's a reason, you know, like I always say, you know, like even things that happen, there's, you know, nothing really happens out of a vacuum, you know, there's, you know, the reason, the conditions that we see around us, there's usually a history and how we ended up here, you know, unless you believe that these people are genetically or just by the mere fact of their, you know, whatever, because they're this, they're going to be that. No, there is, there's a history. There's well, a reason why that, yeah. that black people are treated as not human. Um, right. I, I, I had a big mistake as a white liberal <laughs> yeah. uh, who has black family members. My parents were, my mother was an Irish Catholic. My dad's background comes from something else that's completely okay. different. Um, yeah. But she was, started was part of the movement to integrate the Catholic Church in the 1960s. Um, so it was a black caucus movement. And um, I thought, oh, I, I get it. I understand. Yeah. 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 <laughs> How annoying yeah. I find myself now and I'm thinking my nephew who is now 18, 
He's about six foot eight. He's a scholar and wow. a basketball star. Oh, wow. He's wow. Yeah. yeah. And we went into a liquor store and I was expecting like, okay, white people run across Asian, little old Asian ladies to the other side of the street. They see him coming. They don't see his beauty or yeah. anything. They see yeah. black or whatever yeah. they're seeing, like not right. human or, or, or something. And we went into a liquor store where he wanted to get a certain kind of juice. And I was, so we stopped and we got in. And uh, I was surprised because it was a brown owner. Um, and I won't say what kind of brown. Yeah. Um, but it, re it reminds me that people of African descent were enslaved in every single country. Well, anyway, the story is that the guy greets me really well. That day I happened to look kind of pulled together. <laughs> I'm not sure. He, maybe he would have been nasty yeah. to me if I'd come in like I usually do. And, oh, and yeah. Gap so. sweats or something. Yeah. But he's yeah. very, you know, honored. And, and I could have been, you know, it was like something from a movie. I could have been stuffing Twinkies down. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. he, he right. followed my nephew almost walking on his shoes right. behind him. Yeah. Yeah. And I said to my nephew when we got out in the car, like, you need to have the talk with your dad. This is very yeah. dangerous. You can't come there anymore. You know, and I, I'd been indignant and I'd slam the stuff down on the counter, you know, outraged that this yeah. is my nephew. And he didn't realize it. And he said, you're going to get me killed. I yeah. understood totally what's going on right. in there. And I was so yeah. humbled. Yeah. I was justly humiliated that he said, yeah. you don't, you can't act that way because they won't yeah. kill you. They'll kill me. Right. And I... He said, I understood what was happening. I was very polite. If I went, if I didn't go into places where they acted that way to me, I wouldn't yeah. go anywhere. Right. And yeah. it was like, yeah. I, I was justly humiliated. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and yeah. I just. Um... No, I, I, I get it. I mean, and, and I think even navigating, you know, throughout the world, you, you learn how to, you know, how to do those things, you know, on Someone told me just, you know, I'm less threatening with glasses on. You know, you put a black person, you know, you put glasses on. Whistling you're, Beethoven, you're less, like that famous, yeah. famous essay, yeah. Oh right, God. right, yeah, yeah. You know, um, certain things, you know, certain things you do or say, you know, like the way you talk or what have you know, so those things are, you can say, oh, you're one of those, you know, you're this type of person, you know, and it's it's sad, you know, to, to have to, you know, you have to always have to kind of navigate and, you know, and I guess, you know, I, I, it's, I guess it's, I mean, human nature to a certain degree that we always, we judge things, you know, we, we look and say, oh, okay, well, this person is this or that because of, you know, and even myself, you have to catch and say, okay, well, this person isn't necessarily this because they have this on or look like this, you know, so you have to, and it, it takes training, you know, it takes training for us to see outside of what, you know, our packages, you know, the, to really be able to dig deeper and to really understand this person or see, you know. Yeah, um, the, the but, PTSD and the tension must be extraordinary. I think of my nephew, he's yeah. now about to turn 18 and he was 16 yeah. and that he has to navigate through that in right. life. And yeah. um, going back to your story and not knowing, like yeah. not, you know, I, I I wear glasses. I have to pair yeah. the screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like if you yeah. were black or white or green or purple, and just yeah. that it's really solid, good writing. Yeah. And um, I think again of what Baldwin said. He felt guilty if he didn't write. But I think yeah. you're a generation where you can write. And yeah. just if people, yeah. well, this is really good writer. I want to see one of. Right. Um, I want to see one of Yemen K. Dickinson's movies. Or he's yeah. a screenwriter in the future that, oh, he's yeah. black, you know, yeah. that yeah. I guess this is one of the ways you can educate and you have freedom that Baldwin didn't have a generation ago. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So incremental progress, but yeah. not right. enough. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure. Yeah. Uh, it has been. Discussing all of these things with you and learning, yeah. and thank you for letting me um, be a better teacher. <laughs> yeah, of course. By letting me use your work gratis in my classes. Thank you. All right. Yemen K. Yeah. Dickinson. <laughs> all right.